Okay, wonderful. Um, welcome everyone. This is our final showcase session of the day. Um, this is room A, streamlining assessment creation for videos with ChatGPT. It's our presenters, Hannah and David. Um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, but just quickly as a reminder, please um, stay on mute during the presentation. We will have five minutes at the end for some Q and A. Feel free to put questions or comments in the chat as we go. And um, at the very end, I'd love for you all to stay on for one minute while I give you a link to our survey um, to evaluate your sessions today. All right, I'm gonna turn things over to you guys. Uh, thank you to the uh, most initiative for the opportunity to share what we've been exploring at the Mount uh, with AI and assessment. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joining us uh, now to listen and ask questions. So I'm David Sheeds. Um, I'm an instructional technologist uh, at the Center for Instructional Design and Delivery at Mount St. Mary's University. And with me is... Hi, this is Hannah Katzen Kramer. I'm also an instructional technologist with SID, as we so affectionately call it. Um, but I'm also a lecturer in our School of Education. So today we're talking about our experiment, our experience experimenting with uh, using generative AI to help with uh, the creation of uh, assessments to um, check student understanding of uh, video content. Um, so I first, just as some background history, um, I first tried this pretty recently when Hannah and I were working on uh, developing asynchronous modules about computational thinking for a grant. Um, and we had spent some time uh, vetting videos from content experts that we wanted to use in our modules. Uh, but we also wanted to add some formative or low stakes assessments to the videos so that students could um, self-assess their understanding of what they had just watched. Um, and being like over a break, uh, we were working with some, within some time constraints and was uh, considering scrapping, developing these kind of assessments because uh, if we wanted to do it well, it was going to mean rewatching a lot of videos um, a lot of times to create good assessments. Um, but as it happens, uh, we had recently adopted a uh, new video hosting platform called Yuja. That's um, shown here, uh, the tool. Um, and we were really happy with the quality and accuracy of the um, automatic transcripts it was uh, generating. So. Um, I had the idea to feed the transcripts into ChatGPT 4.0 and then kind of um, interview the transcript to come up with true, false, and multiple choice questions. And I wasn't really happy with the, um, the quality of all the questions out of the box, um, but just having some questions in front of me as a starting point um, was uh, a lot easier than starting from scratch. Like, I knew it was wrong with the questions. Um, based on the content knowledge I had, and I could fix them and improve the distractors to turn them into good uh, questions. And that was a lot less time and effort than it would have uh, taken to make the entire assessment on my own after rewatching a lot of videos a lot of times. So I, I consider that a successful test run. So after that process for us, for those modules we were creating for the grant, we decided that this model would be something that we could expand or specify for our faculty here on campus. So we took that sort of general concept that David used for those MCCE modules and came up with this core concept or big idea that we wanted to explore with all of our faculty. So the big idea kind of became use ChatGPT to um, utilize those transcripts from the videos, uh, in context or in collaboration with the subject matter expert, but also recognizing we needed that facilitation of the instructional designer also there as well to support the process, especially dependent on the comfort level of the specific faculty member. So that was sort of the formula that we came up with to streamline the video content uh, knowledge assessment. And then we're kind of going to skip ahead a little bit towards um, some of the considerations, some of the, our conclusions um, before you try to go into something like this, um, some of the things that we got out of it um, to consider before you start. Um, so first, you'd want to think about whether you have the rights to upload the video to a service that can automatically generate a transcript, and then also think about whether you should be 
training AI on those scripts. You should be uploading those transcripts to a generative AI. Um, but with videos that are in the Creative Commons, um, things that you've recorded yourself or things that are part of an open educational resource, um, those are like less likely to raise a concern about whether you can use or reuse um, the materials in the way that you want to include the transcript. Um, as far as uh, length goes, uh, we talked about one of the main benefits of this process um, really being the time saved by not needing to rewatch the videos uh, during the assessment creation. So with really short videos, it might just be quicker to make the assessments the traditional way. Um, and then as far as longer videos, as instructional designers, both of us, we'd be remiss to not mention that studies show student learning is improved when longer videos are chunked into more manageable lengths. So um, we'd always recommend maybe a maximum of like 15 or 20 minutes as, um, as a good range. So uh, more than three minutes, less than 20 minutes is kind of the target there. Um, when we say quality of transcript, kind of mean mostly accuracy here. Um, your mileage on accuracy may vary depending on the tools that you're using to generate it. Um, if the transcripts aren't accurate, though, they're not uh, they're not likely to produce good results in your assessments. Um, things that might contribute to that are like low audio levels, poor audio quality, I and mean, lots of background noise in your video, um, and also. If you're using very content specific jargon or technical language, those are less likely to be accurately transcribed. You may need to clean up your transcripts before you feed them in. Um, and then also just as an equity concern, some automatic transcription tools um, may be trained and work well on quote unquote standard dialects and accents, and they wouldn't be as accurate for speakers who don't speak with those quote unquote standard accents. Um, so it's just a reminder to think about downstream effects if you're looking at implementing this process, especially at a larger scale, then it may amplify disadvantages that are, are being experienced by uh, marginalized groups. And um, our next point, uh, familiarity with content, you or your collaborator should be familiar with both the content knowledge and the content of the specific video, um, just to be able to figure out if the assessment questions generated are, are accurate and true and whether they're valuable for assessment and aligned to your learning objectives. And then these last two are related, uh, visuals and um, content being represented. <clears throat> if the video relies really heavily on visual elements um, that are not also explicitly in the transcript, it may not be a good candidate for a process like this. Um, in addition to uh, visual things like charts, graphs, maybe animations of a process, even stylistic cues um, like color schemes um, and font choices. Um, there may be other things like your tone of voice, um, jokes, sarcasm, and even uh, music score, uh, music bed that are informing understanding in the video, uh, but that aren't captured in the transcript in any way uh, and won't be able to help inform the creation of an assessment either uh, by being fed into chat GPT. So uh, from an accessibility perspective though, um, it might be just good to get in this habit of thinking about what things are represented primarily visually. Um, and this, this process kind of highlights that, uh, which I thought was interesting. So with these considerations in mind and our big idea or core concept in mind, we thought it might be time to test out a process that's a little bit more formalized that we could put together to utilize with faculty um, as a whole. So the first thing that we did to sort of test out this process is establish some roles and figure out how we were going to tackle this project. Um, I, like I said, am a lecturer in our School of Education. I teach in our um, instructional design and delivery, instructional design and technology master's program, which is asynchronous online. So we used some of my courses. I played the role as the SME. I wore the SME hat. Um, and then David played the instructional designer um, role there. So that was his hat in this process. Um, so since we're asynchronous online, I use a lot of videos in my in my courses. So I picked a, um, a video from my multi multimedia design and theory course, which was all about graphic design and instructional design. So this was a I was already using this video to and assessing learning on it. So some of the key concepts in our course. Um, so that was a good place for us to start. So I took that video and we looked at our 
kind of list of considerations and sort of ran through it. Um, I knew that I had the right to generate the transcript because I made the video, I made the slides. Um, I, I It was all from me. Uh, so I knew I had the right to generate that transcript. Uh, the length of this video was about 14 minutes. So it's a little bit higher on our end of what we like for um, cognitive load, but you know, well within that range for utilizing this process. Um, the quality of the transcript, I did have to check um, since it was about graphic design principles. I was using um, these principles called, it has an acronym of CRAP. Um, that's contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. So when Yuda translated the, the transcript, it thought it was a naughty word. Uh, so I took it out of the transcript. So I had to make sure that that quality was good, but um, we went through that process. Um, I knew I was familiar with the content again because I created the, thank you, Monica. Um, I knew I was familiar with the content because I created it again. So I kn and knew the slides that were there. Um, and for a video about graphic design, I didn't really rely too much on the visuals. We talked, there was examples of like, what's a good design and what's a bad design. Um, but I really made sure to talk through all those things, relating it back to the principles in a very kind of oral way. Um, so I knew that both I was not relying on visuals and also that the content was clearly uh, represented in the transcript. So that was kind of my role at the beginning. And then David um, took the transcript and put it into ChatGPT and he'll talk a little bit about uh, what that is. So at this point, um, I fed the PDF of Hannah's video transcript into ChatGPT 4.0. Um, I asked for an outline of the major points covered to kind of preview what things might become the topic of questions and the future steps. Um, if you do something like this, generating an outline, this as an instructional designer, this might be a good time to check in with your content expert and see how likely they think um, the, the outline is aligning to the points they wanted to make to figure out if it's going to be a good um, to keep moving forward or something went wrong at that point. Um, so next, we... Uh, I, I prompted ChatGPT to create a series of uh, multiple choice and true false questions. And I played around with prompts and like would suggest maybe true false questions should be the focus for um, major points um, or common misconceptions um, and that multiple choice. And we really like the um, choose uh, choose all that apply type multiple choice questions um, as uh, a way to quickly capture lists in your content. Often we we present something and it it fits nicely into a list in a lecture. So um, those those are great for um, uh, multiple choice that are choose all that apply would be really good for that. So I suggested that in the prompts. Um, and then I, as I got responses back, I'd present each round of AI responses to Hannah, uh, our content expert, and uh, we did a few rounds of reprompting to try to get some better questions. And we'll talk about that step um, a little bit later in our process analysis as well. So then the final step was to implement that into my course. Um, just because of my role as an instructional technologist as well, I was able to do this on my own um, with, the, with the questions that we selected together. Depending on, again, the comfort level of the individual faculty member, this might look more collaborative than it did in our case. I could just kind of take these questions and run. Um, I only had two students in this class. You know, the mountain is a really small, <laughs> really small school, so I didn't have a lot of data about how this went. But you know, I was able to do that part by myself. So we talked a bit about our process earlier. Um, and we just wanted to talk a little bit more about the prompting and collaboration um, as well. Um, some of the things we noticed while prompting. Um, Details that we might have introduced early in the prompting process um, tended to get the AI to be kind of hyper focused on those details in the rest of its responses, which was not what we wanted. We kind of wanted this very general uh, understanding of the content. Um, in one case, we just had to start from scratch because it couldn't lose that focus on some of the details we were providing in our prompt earlier on. Um, we only really got maybe a handful out of a dozen questions that we thought were good candidates for assessing student understanding. Um, and then many of those still needed some tweaking from uh, the instructor, from Hannah, to make, make them more accurate or improve the quality of the distractors in the multiple choice questions. I mean, you might have noticed in a previous slide, um, all of the true false questions that he gave us had a correct answer of false. Um, this was like 
lots of them. Uh, so we prompted ChatGPT to change, kind of invert all the true false questions so they had a true answer instead, which sometimes really changed kind of the focus of the, the question too, um, which made it convenient to try to pick which of the two versions um, better highlighted the learning objective um, or, and also just so we didn't have, we had a mix of correct responses between true and false. Um, and then again, through the, the a DEI lens, um, would recommend at some point building into your process um, a moment to reflect on whether the the AI you're using is introducing or amplifying any biases um, in the the types of questions you're generating. Um, and then we'd recommend uh, so we recognize rather uh, many of our content experts um, are looking to add. Uh, formative assessments and are not always comfortable working with generative AI. So we'd recommend working with instructional designers, AI prompting with AI prompting experience to um, to to do that. And uh, I think we just have a minute left here. Sorry, Annika, I see the time. Um, looking ahead, we're we're thinking of going and looking at the closed captioning files with the timestamps. Um, as a way to feed that in and get get results back with timestamps so that's easier to feed into our video hosting quizzing engine. Um, we're also considering, and I noticed a comment um, earlier, um, designing a GPT, uh, tailoring a GPT for this purpose that kind of takes on some of the, the lift that the instructional designer is doing. Um, and that might also, um, take over some of those steps that include being able to see the visual elements in the video multimedia wise. And then finally, we'll be looking at um, formalizing this framework again, kind of taking the data that we and that we learned from this process the first time and kind of creating ourselves guiding questions um, to help instructors and decide whether or not they want to engage in this process in the first place. And happy to take any questions. Thanks, everyone. Great. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. That was pretty cool. Um, I know it's something that many faculty want to do, but don't necessarily have the time to, to do all the work it takes. So it's great to see a way to, to facilitate that process using AI. Um, OK, any uh, questions for um, yeah, I see just, from Kelly? Yeah, yeah oh. just a tiny question. What, what, can you explain more about ID facilitation? You have two item refine prompts. The second item ID facilitation. Can you can you speak more a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, on the ID facilitation, that's um, instructional designer or instructional design facilitation. So working with an instructional designer, um, kind of the idea that an instructional designer might know how to prompt ChatGPT, have those skills, and that. Uh, our our content uh, experts, content knowledge experts, don't need the expertise of how to work with um, generative AI to help in that process, and instead could work with um, someone like Hannah or myself, instructional technologists, instructional designers, to um, to either learn the process for themselves or have it facilitated when they when they're looking to do it. And there's a question from Kelly. She's wondering what quiz engine did you feed the questions into after? Yeah, we um, we are using what's called Yuja, um, uh, Yuja video hosting. I'm not sure which, there was a good slide, not this one. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's called Yuja and it, it allows you to get the, um, uh, kind of pause points as you're playing and put questions in. I can also, with our Canvas LMS, can feed into the gradebook and um, do some of the uh, grading as well. Great. Um, Loretta is wondering what who owns what's created out of this production. Does ChatGPT own any of this new content? Uh, I think that uh, I don't. I think basically there's no. My understanding is there's not ownership of AI generated content. I'm not I'm not a legal expert on on all that, but uh, my understanding is uh, generative AI 
produced content is essentially immediately not created by a person and therefore not subject to copyright. But we also turn it into good questions. So that might change uh, the status there. Ram is noting that ownership depends on the subscription that you're using. Super. Any other questions for David and Hannah? All right. Well, I'm going to say thank you to you guys very much. Uh, it's a great presentation, and I'm going to stop.